with me is a friend of mine, or someone who's become a friend of mine, professional, we don't spend Christmas together, but um, we're very, very friendly. And he, this gentleman is someone that when I go to Amsterdam and I know we're just there for a week, we try as often as we can to have dinner together because we really enjoy each other's company. This is Doug Gunn from the Vintage Showroom. And um, Doug is a pretty special person. Hi, Doug, how you doing? Hey, Andrew, how are you? Good. Uh, I just want to say I was super excited about the, the Amsterdam show this time around. So I was really, really, amongst everything else, I, I was sorry that we, we've got to do this virtually and I don't get to uh, have dinner with you this time. But I think it's great that you've set this platform up to everyone to con can connect while, uh, while this crisis is going on. But yes, hopefully, it's hopefully nice to see your face, sir. Nice to see your face. Hopefully tons of people get, who don't, maybe don't know you get to see you and um, that would be good. Yeah, you never know. Um, why don't you tell our audience what you do and, and maybe a little bit about your background and how you got into what you're doing? Um, so I'm co-owner in the Vintage Showroom. We're a London-based business. Um, I started in 2007 with my business partner, Roy Luckett. We're usually at the Kingpin shows together, so everyone would have seen him around. Um, it was a simple idea, really. We We wanted to put a, a vintage collection in a, a we wanted to, to showcase a really refined vintage menswear collection in a way that we hadn't seen anyone doing in, uh, in the UK or Europe and really kind of gear that to designers, theater wardrobes, film design. And it was really so they could use this as a resource, as a library, if you like to, to buy or rent or take images of uh, pieces in our collection that they can use for a, uh, for design. So um, that's how we started. I think we had about two months money when we started. Uh, we, we, we've been here about 12 years now. So we've, uh, I think we've lasted two recessions, but this is our first pandemic. So, uh, you know, <laughs> we, we're fingers crossed like everyone at the moment. What's left is um, you got flood and fire. What else is left? Yeah, I know. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tough, uh, tough gig. Nothing. And London is on the on the on the list of the places most prone to have uh, flooding. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've uh, we've we've been all right with that. Uh, we our insurance would cover us for flood. It doesn't cover us for pandemics. Uh, but uh, what can you what can you do? So uh, that was the first yeah. question when this started, because of course, <laughs> we're not doing our show. People all said to me, "Well, of course you have insurance, right, Andrew, for for event disasters." And yeah. I was, I don't have any insurance. And then finally, mom. Without, uh, without knowing it, my lawyer called me and said, I want you to know that, um, that none of the insurances for, for the event of disruption would have covered this disease. No. So. No, uh, absolutely not. So um, Doug and I met, you want to tell the story where we met? Before I tell the story of where we met, I'll tell the story of, how, of where the, the place where we met. There's a fellow in Toronto for all those out there called Rogerio de Souza, who's been doing vintage clothes warehousing for a, and retail for a really, really long time. He's my age, he's from Brazil. He's had an incredible life. He's an incredible guy. He participated as a vendor in the first denim days in Amsterdam. And I like to go to his stores from time to time when I'm in Toronto and Doug. You know, you know it's actually his birthday today. So my next call is gonna be to wish him a happy birthday. How old, but, um, how old is he today? I, I don't, I don't know actually. I'll, I'll ask him and let you know. But he's a. Uh, he's 60. But, I think he's 60. I believe he's 65, 64, 66. Yeah, I think, I think that sounds about right. I mean, he's, he's doing, he's in great shape for his age. He looks, career, 50, he looks, 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 looks like a rough 50 year old. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's a, he's a character. I mean, I was looking before this conversation, I was looking through my email thread and I actually met you in, well, I was introduced to you in May 2014. And so I'd been at the show in Amsterdam with Roy the month before, and we'd seen your show and uh, we were super impressed with it. We'd had a, neither of us had been Amsterdam for ages. We'd had a great time in Amsterdam. We came back and we were like, we've got to get involved with this Kingpin show. Didn't have a clue who you were or, or any of the organizers. I think I'd seen your picture. And then uh, a so, month later, I'm in Toronto. I mean, <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in Toronto in uh, Ruggiero's shop and uh, I think I was probably having a beer and a cigar with him or something and then in you walked and I was like, uh, this is the man I've got to meet. So Shit. <laughs> uh, he, he, 
I think he came to London a, a month later and we showed around the showroom. And then uh, you haven't been able to shake us ever since. We've been part of the Kingpin's furniture and you're stuck with us now. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's been great. I mean, we, for our part, we've loved the involvement with, with Kingpins, with you guys. Amsterdam's always such a highlight of our year, so uh, especially. So uh, well, what, you do is, what you do is really exquisite. And for those that don't know, Doug also has a, a store, or has had a store until COVID, in Covent Garden, which is a beautiful store as well. Yeah, no, that's a really nice. We sort of got that a few years after we opened the showroom, and that was, that was great. I mean, at the time, we shouldn't have been... We had a landlord that was, we were paying him cash each week. I mean, he was a great guy. You know, he's, his, uh, his wife who, he, he passed away, his wife's now our landlady. She's amazing. She rang me a day after the, the COVID sort of lockdown hit in London, just to say, don't worry about your rent for a month, really took the pressure off us for at least for April. So, I mean, we've been very lucky over the years with the, with, with the places we found and, and where we've been. So, uh, but yeah, but, um, Ruggiero, he's a, he's a one in a million for sure. So uh, we also, Doug and I also um, invested in a book. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so we did. I think uh, I, I came to you with a proposition that was, I think my words were, there's no way you're going to lose money on this, Andrew. <laughs> but uh, we made a very beautiful book, which was Worn, uh, worn Kingpins um, with uh, Sue Barra and John Turner, the photographer. Um, it was really, really great project. I really love it. And uh, it's, it's trickled out at the show. So I think we've got a future in it, I think. Uh, and, and I hope we can do something going forward. Uh, our, store, our store sells it. Yeah. So it was a beautiful kind of mix of kind of street shots and vintage denim. And uh, Sue kind of put the kind of concept together. We say it was like kind of Western thematic. So, yeah, really nice. I think hopefully it's... Uh, a lot of people are sat looking at it for research while they're stuck at home. Good, good. Um, tell us about how you see the business going forward. I mean, when, when do you see your business going back and how do you see it looking? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Like for the last couple of years, we've, we've invested heavily in digital. So, I mean, I think both from business, both because we saw it as a good strategy for our business and also because I think both Roy and myself are interested in leaving some kind of legacy for our collection for the future. So we've kind of set up a digital archive, which we've been playing around with for a couple of years and uh, it's starting to get traction. I think people are particularly interested in using it at the moment because they haven't got the luxury of visiting us in person. So any kind of online resources are suddenly really, you know, fundamental for the design process for the designers. So I think, Definitely that side of it, we, we're going to continue to focus on. And uh, while the Kingpins week, Kingpins days is going on, we're doing a few things. We've, we're going to put some of Alter's digital archive live on that. So people, all the Kingpins attendees will be able to access that as a kind of a complimentary kind of platform. So I think that's an important side for us. I like to think that, you know, we're going to have two or three months of hardship and then things are going to get back to some level of normality in regards to, you know, people are still going to need to travel. They might reduce their travel, but they're still going to need to go and, and look for ideas and inspiration. So I hope we, we, you know, three months down the line, we're going to see some kind of back to normal attitude out there. Um, hopefully people, you know, use this time to reflect on 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 where we go wrong as as humans really so i mean i think there's a there's a big question around the uh, consumption i think definitely people should reflect on there's a lot of people still having to work out there that are on the front line of this who are a lot of the times are kind of undervalued and underpaid in society so i hope there's a kind of balancing of that uh, going forward but yeah i mean it's it's really really interesting to think what the world's going to look like in three or six months time. But hopefully we get, we will get through this with as few deaths as possible. It's, it's been amazing because I've interviewed people from all over the world, from Brazil. Um, he was talking about the guy from Brazil, from Bicunia was talking about, they have a factory, I think he said Ecuador and that's shut down and Brazil was shut down. And then the next one I did was in Pakistan. They were shut down. And we all know that India has got 700 million people shut down. Yeah, it's this is such a global 
thing. It's like I've never seen a moment that the globe the globe is all shared one thing so universally. It's yeah, sad, but we it's like really we all taste the same thing. Yeah, I think and yeah, I mean it's definitely I'd say it's not it is it's definitely some parts of society are going to feel the brunt of this a lot harder. So I do worry about, you know, and 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 obviously countries with less developed healthcare systems are really, you know, I really feel for for, for people there. So. Yeah. Um all right, well, let's go back to a more pleasant subject. What what is it that you that made you get into denim and actually you know, got into your blood. Like, where was, where did you get the injection? I was, I was thinking, it's uh, one of the things I love about the Kingpin show is that there, there are so many denim fanatics, aren't there? I mean, it's like oh. people, it's like people, it's their passion, it's their obsession. It, and it is, and, and I feel like you've got a lot of them come to your show. And it's, it's quite, it is, it has got that kind of family feel about it, which I really like. Um, I think for me, definitely like TV and film. Like as a kid, I was obsessed with cowboys. I was set, obsessed with westerns. I wanted to be a cowboy. I was always like, a, you know, that that was my thing. And who's you know, your favorite actor? Who's your favorite actor? Uh, from that era, I think like John Wayne. I was a big John Wayne fan. But like later, like you know, I loved the spaghetti westerns. So like Clint Eastwood, and you know, it was. Uh, so I think um, it was. You know, that was definitely the sort of wardrobe side of it I liked, you know, and it was Hollywood sort of told us that cowboys wore denim. And so I was really into it, into that look. I was I was trying to think one of my earliest shopping memories was like as a kid dragging. I must have been late 70s, early 80s. So I was probably 10 or less. And I took my I got my dad to take me to the shop called Dickie Dirts. And it was. I just remember it being the most amazing place I'd ever been. And I think it was in an old cinema on Fulham Road or something. And they'd ripped all the chairs out and it was just piles and piles of denim. And I remember being just, it was like these pillars of denim everywhere. And it was all these American brands I'd never heard of. And uh, my dad wasn't at all in, in, I don't think I ever saw my father in a pair of jeans in his life. So it was like, I must, I, I must have dragged him there. And I think, like for me, I, I always wear jeans. I'm like, you know, my wardrobe is basically row and row of denim jeans, so it's kind of crazy. But um, I think definitely got got into it there. And I remember being a teenager; it was the the sort of Portobello market and Camden market, and everyone was buying vintage five hundred ones, and you know that whole kind of look was was massive. So yeah, I think ever since really, it's got in, got into my blood. So yeah. How do you see vintage as a business going forward? It's interesting because it's like um, it's funny because I got friends that really don't know what I do, uh, and you know, and they they say, "Oh, vintage is really having a moment at the moment." You know, it's like <laughs> as if uh, it's kind of uh, this is before COVID nineteen, but but the uh, I think it's great that people are looking at it like we've always really valued stuff, one off pieces, and, and and the things that we collect, and the fact that we've always treated them like antiques and if people want to wear these things with, and treat them with care, I think that's great. And you can have really unique wardrobe pieces that people mix with their every day. So definitely from a consumption point of view, I think it's great that people are, you know, the, the idea of people swapping their closets or, or using, you know, buying secondhand, looking at vintage in this way, I think can only be a positive thing, you know? So, uh, but I think for what we do, we're always, people are always going to be intrigued by designs from the past. So I feel that as long as people are designing new collections, they always want to study how things were made or constructions of fabrics. I know a lot of the stuff we do with Ultra is looking at how we can make new, new fabrics look like old fabrics. So, I mean, it's that kind of emphasis on how you take things from the past and make them relevant. So, I think for us, hopefully, we've still got a business at the end of this where we'll continue to work with design inspiration and also that our retail will continue. People that want to buy things that are a little bit different or not kind of, you know, something that's got a bit of an emotional, a bit of heart and soul, I think. That's the... I understand. I always yeah. love the romance of vintage, you know. So. And then, of course, we have to talk about Roy. 
Yeah, or Roy. Yeah, he, I don't know why Roy like, was here, but he must I, have, he must have had another interview somewhere else that was of more importance. <laughs> I I, I, I love lo a little bit there. Yeah, Roy, Roy. For those that don't know, isn't a fan of uh, modern technology particularly. So he's uh, we we have a weekly Zoom meeting, which the first sort of ten minutes is him trying to find out where the box is and where the sound is. So right, right, right. I thought I'd spare, I'd spare you, spare you that, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah, me, I've probably known Roy since like early 2000 or something. So we, uh, we, we would have met at Portobello Market, Portobello Market. For really? those That's what yeah. So we were both, uh, he, he had, he's been, I think he said the other day, he, he hasn't worked since the 1980s. He's always done his own thing in, in vintage. So. He was quite well established. Uh, he'd had a few shops and was at Portobello Market when I started. Uh, I was, it, was, it was a funny situation because there was about four dealers at Portobello and we all knew each other and we'd meet on a Friday and we'd all we'd be in competition, but we'd all have a cup of tea and a chat. And, and all the guys we were buying off were all based in Toronto. And uh, they would all hate Where me. I'm from. Where I'm from. Yeah, okay. So uh, there was a lot of uh, vintage coming out of Toronto, Canada. And so we had this situation where we were all kind of friendly, if you like, in London, and all the people we were buying from hated each other, and they could they were having proper rag wars in Canada. So um, we had this, uh, you know, we got to know each other, and then we kind of planned that we wanted to do something together around this this building, uh, an archive, and uh, it kind of went on from there. But I think the first thing I ever asked him was, it was a, a the first time I went to Portobello. It was it was a bit of a wild west setup uh, back then. It was a very interesting uh, dynamic, and uh, as the new boy, I was always kind of stuck in the corner or in the worst stall underneath a leak or something. And I think I asked him for a cover or something, and he he didn't give me any help, you know. And it was I think the first day I turned up, I had someone trying to fight me next door because I had taken an extra inch of their stall over or something. So it was uh, it was an interesting learning curve. I think it always makes me laugh that when you see like these programs like The Apprentice or whatever, they always make people who want to get into business do a market stall because you understand, you know, sale, you understand profit, sales, stock level, level. it's a, it's a, a tough learning curve. So uh, it's quite funny. I don't miss those early mornings. I used to be down there at five in the morning on a Friday and Saturday. Though. Well, we're going to do that when we go to, when we do this, this Amsterdam event. Yeah, um, it's going to start at nine o'clock in Amsterdam, which I'm in Houston, so that'll be two in the morning for me. Oh wow, yeah, that's there. You need a nice, nice glass of tequila in your hand when you're doing yeah, it. Be an early, that'll be an early kickoff. Doug, <laughs> it's, it's fantastic to talk to you. I'm glad we have this opportunity. Yeah, and thanks, Andrew. No, it's really, it's really good to see you. it, and I hope everybody enjoys it as much as I enjoy talking to you. Thanks, buddy. Always a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>